Coming up on show 798, it's been a long time coming, but the Audi e-tron GT has been spied again, looking very ready. Stick around, I'll give you the details. Plus, on the podcast today, we're talking about Polestar and Koenigsegg, maybe, maybe not working together. Uh, a new trial for vehicle-to-grid Kona batteries being used for static storage and a shuffle at the top of Volkswagen Group gives the Porsche CEO a promotion? I think it is. We'll stick around. Those stories and more coming up on today's podcast. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily for Wednesday, 3rd of June. My name is Martin Lee, going through every EV story so you don't have to. Thank you, as always, to myev.com for helping me make the show in the US. MyEV.com is a marketplace that's totally free to use, and let's face it, we all love something for free at the moment, given the problems that uh, many people are going through. And it's specifically about EVs. It really simplifies buying and selling uh, an EV. And it is your helping hand, your right-hand man, along the way as well. Kicking off with the lead story today, then, on the podcast. The last time we saw the Audi e-tron GT test vehicle it was uh, rolling around Porsche's neighborhoods and actually sporting a pair of the Porsche very distinctive Porsche Taycan wheels this time around the sighting comes near Audi's headquarters in Ingolstadt and it's uh, back to wearing its own wheels too which I gotta admit are very very nice looking Audi wheels not much has changed in the camouflage department but a new set of photos have emerged that are super res HD quality according to motor1.com while we can't find out any details yet about the running gear underneath, the car is looking very sharp. And although it's covered in camouflage, we can see what it's going to look like. Of course, we know that it's inspired by, built on the same platform as uh, the cousin car, Porsche Taycan. Audi won't even let slip any of the specs, but you haven't got to go too far away from the concept car uh, you're looking at something like 582 brake horsepower. Uh, the production version might scale things back a little bit. Uh, maybe it'll be less competitive than a Taycan Turbo because the price will be a little bit less. The standard Taycan develops, what is it, 522 horsepower from its combined motors. So the e-tron GT from Audi, around that level, maybe a little bit less because the price will be a little bit less. I'm really excited about that, actually. And it's the styling of it as well, which just looks absolutely stunning. Not a car that will be sitting on my driveway, unfortunately. Uh, but you never know. can always dream. It's looking absolutely gorgeous. Oh, gorgeous. Uh, right, Polestar and Koenigsegg are next. They got the internet all uh, frothy a couple of days ago. And then the truth, what well, turns out to be a little less exciting than we initially thought, Polestar and Koenigsegg, of course, two fine Swedish companies. Now, they posted photos of the Polestar Precept. It's a concept. And also the Koenigsegg uh, Gamera. Also, a four-seat mega car. And they posted a picture of those two cars together on social media. And those photos led to many people to speculate and believe the two Swedish companies were collaborating on some sort of new electric technology. After all, the post, the social media post they put up said that something exciting was coming and to stay tuned. Well, of course, stay tuned is also what you would say if you wanted somebody to watch something. And it turns out that's all this is, which is a bit of a shame, but still very cool. According to Car and Driver, uh, they asked if the collaboration would involve technology transfer and working together. The Polestar spokesman told Car and Driver that there will be none at all. The brands are friendly and decided to have some fun with two cars that everyone wants to enjoy. The promotional video is going to be released on June 25th, so really the stay tuned reference was all about watching a promotional video with those two cars coming from Polestar and Koenigsegg as well. What Polestar did, did tell Car and Driver, it seems like they have a good relationship between the two companies, and that doesn't close the door to some sort of tech collaboration in the future. Uh, but for now, though, just having fun with their art departments and a few pictures on social media, that's a real shame. But also, it's exciting because you know, Koenigsegg's a name that's been around in the hypercar world for a long time now, and gradually, increasingly going electric to get that more performance which we know that electric power does bring and what about power 
into your home. Vehicle to grid is something that continues to fascinate me. Uh, whatever you want to call it. Vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, vehicle to X. Uh, the idea of using a battery storage when your car is parked up, which let's face it, is nearly all of the time. Different stats I've read over the years, but 90 or 95% plus or minus is how long your personal car sits doing nothing. We all massively overestimate how much we use our own car. And given that it's not doing anything when it's just sitting there, I'm fascinated by the idea of how it be can become part of our energy future. Storing energy is going to be the key for the next century of how we use energy on this planet. Now a new trial is starting in the UK across the Midlands, South West and South Wales. The electric vehicle trial uh, with Electric Nation is opening up domestic vehicle to grid users by offering a free installation of the smart chargers worth £5,500 for the duration of the project for a couple of years. They've got to have a Nissan, a Nissan vehicle with a 30 kilowatt hour or more battery. And if you are part of the trial, you'll be able to use your Nissan car to power your home and support the grid. Now, to undertake the Electric Nation Vehicle to Grid trial, a company called CrowdCharge. CrowdCharge is recruiting uh, the first 100 people to trial the state-of-the-art domestic v to g chargers and help the network operators further understand how vehicle to grid charging will work with their electricity networks in the electric nation trial each supplier will use their own chargers to test various different services like uh, crowd charges demand management platform which is all about optimizing charging sessions and i get that i get that your car can become quite smart so that you know i'm going to work tomorrow the commute is 50 miles. Make sure that you have that in the battery and a bit to spare as well in case it's cold and rainy. And then off you go. Then you can use the rest for the car or you can charge it overnight when it's cheap or put that back into the house in the afternoon when electricity is more expensive. Now, for those that do get signed up to the trial in the UK, uh, there's a couple of options. At the end of the trial, you can keep the charger and you'll end up owning it. Uh, it's a one-off fee of £250 at the end of the trial, but considering the charger costs five and a half grand, that's a big saving. What on earth are they doing to a vehicle-to-grid charger to make it worth five and a half thousand pounds? I mean, if, you know, because I paid, okay, so it was subsidised, but we had our Zappy V2 put in a couple of weeks ago, and the whole job was way less than a £1,000, which I know is still a lot of money, and it's still discretionary money, and I appreciate that we're in a fortunate position to be able to do that, don't get me wrong, virus times are scary times for many, um, but five and a half grand for any piece of technology that sits on the wall to get energy out of a DC battery and put it into your AC home? I mean, look, if you're going to do that, if you're going to spend five and a half grand on something, and I appreciate you're not because they're free with the trial, a home battery system is between four and seven thousand pounds, and that is going to be custom designed to power your home. When there's a power cart, there's going to be all sorts of extra benefits of having static storage in your garage or under your stairs or something rather than using your car. However, uh, if you don't want the charger at the end of it, they'll take it away in a couple of years' time and reconnect up your existing, uh, what they call, dumb or smart charger. If you want to find out more details, I'll pop a link in the show notes. Would you like something like this to happen where you live? Would you like your local ele electricity to provider uh, to offer something like this, like a trial? Would you be one of the first ones, or would you step back for a bit and see how it all goes. I'm surprised that these trials are ongoing for a couple of years when Vehicle to Grid has been going on for many years in places like Japan where there'll be loads of data. If you can find out a, a partner to collaborate with, a load of that data, I mean, at least different countries are different, but a lot of that data will be out there. And so they're not exactly starting from scratch. But anyway, either way, it's great that these electricity companies want to start learning more about how our electric cars will be part of our electric homes. All right, moving on. And Hyundai and Hanwha are going to work together, sign a memorandum of understanding to jointly develop energy storage systems based on used Kona batteries. Well, the move is believed to benefit both companies as it helps Hyundai to do away with used batteries efficiently and, and ensure a consistent supply of batteries for Hanwha to develop energy storage systems, or ESSs. According to the website Electric Vehicle Web, as the world progresses towards an electric future, the demand for energy storage is going to increase uh, 2017 figures show that there was about 3. Point, uh, about 3 gigawatt hours of storage 
rolled out, and that would have changed a lot in the last couple of years. But by 2040, some say it's got to go from 3 to 379 gigawatt hours of installed storage on the planet, and it's a good business to be in. I've said it a few times on this podcast, uh, not that I think you should ever invest in single stocks or single things um because that's just not what i talk about on this on this show you know people say oh you should recommend people buy tesla please don't if you want to sleep at night if you want a roller coaster ride you go for it if your money but personally i wouldn't recommend doing that but if you are going to invest in something over the next 10 or 20 years energy storage is certainly in my mind an interesting bet However, uh, moving on, uh, uh, lithium-ion battery cells have been talked about for years as coming out of cars to be used in Second Life projects. I've read about these on the podcast for years now. What are we on? 800 shows in two days' time. I've lost count of how many stories I've done about so-and-so and and -and so-and-so have joined forces for Second Life batteries. It's always uh, the beginning of a scheme. And when I check in on these things a year or two later, the thing is... These batteries in our cars aren't coming out of the cars. Okay, there's fleets of test cars. There's fleets of cars used for pre-production models, and they scrap them at the end and take the batteries out. And occasionally a car will get written off in a bad crash, and the battery becomes available. But nothing like on a scale which they talk about, because EV batteries are lasting way, way longer than most people talked about a few years ago they're just so well managed in terms of the thermal management all right don't quote me on early nissan leaf batteries but generally speaking all of these second life battery projects they get announced and i don't know any that are doing great business at the moment because the batteries in the cars they're just too good all right moving on and let's talk about the porsche ceo oliver bloom getting a promotion? Well, I guess it is. He's going to be installed as the head of the VW brand. Now, Volkswagen chief exec Herbert Diess, he looks after the group of VW. He's planning to promote Porsche CEO Oliver Bloom to take over as the head of VW, the the brand VW, uh, according to a report from Automotor and Sport, uh, citing uh, company sources uh, who uh, the German site said Bernhard Meyer who currently sits at the head of VW's Skoda brand, will lead Porsche in Bloom's place. So a bit of musical chairs going on here at Volkswagen Group, says Autoblog. The ID3 launch has been marred by software issues. They still say that this summer, I mean, we're June now, it, that, that summer, uh, but so is July and August. I'm being cheeky. This summer, the ID3 will make it to market as promised with the finished software. Uh, Manager Magazine in Germany says company engineers saying the basic architecture uh, was developed too hastily because of an underlying issue. Various modules don't understand each other and suffer dropouts. The brand new eighth generation Golf launch was troubled as well and pushed back due to software problems. So it looks like someone who just launched a very good accomplished EV. We're looking at you, Porsche Taycan. Uh, the guy who did that, well, the guy who oversaw the teams that did that, is being, I mean, promoted. I mean, I know Porsche's a sexy company, but there are more VW sold per year, so I suppose that would be a promotion. It's got to be. It's a bigger company, right? It's a bigger thing to work. I would like the Porsche gig, personally, Uh, but uh, you're talking to a a more defined audience. You can make a certain type of car, but anyway, I'm sure that he would like the promotion and uh, someone from Skoda coming across to do the Porsche uh, job. Looks like he's being parachuted in as someone who just launched a great EV to sort out these problems. Autocar makes clear that Herbert Diess is retaining control of Volkswagen Group. He's going nowhere, uh, but the day-to-day management of the brand goes to bloom, and since 2015, he joined Porsche in 2015. Uh, The changes follow on from the reshuffle last week, where Volvo's CTO was uh, moved on. Matthias Rabe, Rabe was moved on to Bentley. Let's talk a bit more about Polestar, actually. I'm really excited about Polestar. Polestar 2, uh, cooperating with a network called a plug... A, it's not really a charging network. Uh, plug Surfing here in Europe offers its customers access to almost 200,000 charge points on their network. Um, that should make public charging easier. 
Across borders, according to Carrier Electrive, every Polestar 2 which gets delivered in Europe will come with an RFID tag on the passenger seat, just waiting for you to start using. Uh, using your plug surfing account as a payment and authentication solution, uh, customers have easy access to the various charging operators uh, in Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland and UK. And you get your plug surfing app, I've got mine, you get your charging key. I like plug surfing. Uh, they say that in Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, there's also plug surfing plus one of these subscription services, and it's going to cost you plug surfing plus costs about 20 euros a month, and you get cheaper charging rates at Ionity. A couple more stories, three more actually. Last year, Geely launched its new Geometry electric car brand in China with the Geometry A. It was a sedan, and now it's time to take a look at their second one. It's not called the B, even though the first one was the A, they're calling it the C, which just messes with my brain a little bit. Uh, it says Scar Car Scoops Geometry C is based on the Geely M Grand uh, car. Uh, it features a new front and rear design to match the looks of the Geometry brand, though. Uh, it sports a new C pillar and a floating roof design, about the same size as a Nissan Leaf, if I can paint that picture for you. Uh, one of its main competitors, obviously. The Geometry C has a single electric motor, two battery sizes, 51.9 and 61.9 kilowatt hours in the Geometry A, and I would presume those battery sizes are going to be offered to the Geometry C, Geely's electric brand in China. Well, Fiat Chrysler is piloting a couple of actually a couple of stories to finish off the podcast today from FCA. Uh, Fiat Chrysler is piloting a project in its historic Italian home of Turin to allow hybrid plug-in cars to automatically switch to electric only mode when entering a congested city center. According to a Reuters report today, and isn't this interesting? Uh, this trial was done there was a german trial where it was a very manual thing when you entered cities you got an alert or a push notification on your mobile phone this would take control of your car and switch the engine off when you go into a no car zone or a no combustion zone the project aims to maximize the benefits of hybrid cars as fca rolls out its first alternative engine models uh, trying to make up ground on rivals around Europe. The project, named Turin Geofencing Lab, involves the city authorities and public transport and based on a prototype system with onboard sensors on the car. Now, they recognise when you enter the restricted zone and the sensors turn off the combustion engine and turn your plug-in hybrid to full electric mode. It's being tested on the new Jeep Renegade um, 4, 4XE, but considering 4x4s, when you see 4x4 spell on paper, it's 4x4, but you say out loud 4x4. Uh, I, on paper, the Jeep Renegade's called the 4xe, but would, do I say 4xe? Which sounds weird. A bit kumbaya. Anyway, the 4xe uh, hybrid plug-in model is the first one they are testing it with. Interesting tech, right? So if, if many cities around the world are going to go to emissions free, but they don't want to put off plug-in hybrid owners and buyers, well, the car makers don't. So this is really interesting. If they can promise you that you can still use your car in those kind of areas, you're more likely to buy a plug-in than a full electric. However, how can you guarantee there's enough battery in, uh, enough energy in the battery? When you approach that zone, then say you've only got enough for a mile the engine has to kick in again say you drive around that internal city zone all day long at some point the battery's gonna run out and at then at that point the engine has to turn on or you break down and at which point you're inside the emissions free zone emitting things do you then get fined and is that fine automatic does it just drop on your doorstep one day to say your engine came on Give us some money, fight your city fine. Or do you get away with it? You've got to be caught by the cops or something. It's a great idea. I've got more questions than answers at the moment, but I love this kind of stuff. And finally, looking at the all-new, all-electric Fiat 500, uh, you might think the automaker was a little bit lazy in designing it. After all, the new Fiat 500 electric looks like the old Fiat 500. And at first glance, it does look like the combustion car, but 
Fiat say the thing has been designed from the ground up with a blank sheet of paper. It's pure coincidence that it looks exactly like the other car. Um, but I'm being a little bit facetious. Of course, they have designed it from scratch to be an EV. But they've kept the styling. Well, Fiat was kept afloat by the 500 uh, that it launched back in 2008, the model that was so good and popular. It's still made today. In fact, it'll be kept in production alongside the new electric model, but they can't make it on the same line because they're totally different cars. According to Inside EVs, with the new electric model, uh, then Fiat wanted to keep all of the aesthetic qualities that made the car such a hit. And it, it really is a great car. Uh, however, the electric one is more premium. It's more grown up. It's electric only, and a lot of work went into making that new Fiat 500 the best that it can be. If you're curious about that, they've made a documentary about how it was done, and I'll pop a link in the show notes if you've got some time to watch something online. Right, question of the week time. Send me your thoughts on this, and I'll read them out on Sunday's show. A Saturday show, by the way, is going to be a return of the Saturday special interview series. This week, uh, we are talking about the future of who'll be driving EVs and learning to drive in an EV and also insurance as well. Have you found your insurance going up or down when you drive an EV? We'll be talking about those things with one of the big, big insurance companies here in the UK. Uh, been a long time lining this one up, as you can imagine. However, I'm really pleased that we've got them on the show on Saturday. I'm looking forward to that chat. Got plenty of questions to ask. Uh, about things like that. But this week's question of the week for Sunday is this. Well, critics will always say that EVs are only for the rich. So what do you view as affordable? I know that everyone's, it's it's very subjective. So, but that's the point of it is I want to know what you think. What do you think affordable is in EV terms? Email me. Well, the address is hello at evnewsdaily.com or you can leave a comment on the YouTube show. Thank you, as always, to all my patrons. Uh, it's what we're on uh, the, the, the third of the month. Uh, and so the billing cycle has been well and truly done. Thank you for everyone that uh, continues to support the show. Uh, my patrons at uh, premium partner level are Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East. Join us on the first of the month. Phil Roberts of Electric Future. Brad Crosby, who's been there a very long time. Thank you, Brad. Avid Technology. Brightsmith Group for Clean Tech Talent. Porsche of the Village Cincinnati and Audi of Cincinnati East. If you can take a couple of minutes and leave a little review on Apple Podcasts, it really helps me grow the show, but no worries if not, because I know you're busy. In the meantime, come and say hi on social media by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>